Um, welcome everybody to my little talk about uh, DOS MU and free DOS. Um, just to get an idea about um, what people have done, uh, is there anybody in this room who's ever used DOS MU in the past 20 years? Well, it's quite a few hands. <laughs> uh, how about free DOS? Probably about the same crowd. <laughs> a few may have used free DOS on, on bare hardware. That's uh, nice to see so many users. Um, it's actually the very first time in my life that I'm giving a, a talk about, about these two uh, projects. So, let me introduce myself. I, my name is Bart Oldman. I've been a long-term maintainer of DOSM. Between about 2001 and 2013, I started contributing a, um, about a year before. And uh, I've also maintained the MEM utility for a while. Um, I bought a few slides for this talk from Jim Hall, who is the long-term free DOS uh, project coordinator. Um, I myself had to step down a little bit from open source project just because of uh, family life taking over and uh, running after two little kids that, that takes a lot of time away from doing programming. <laughs> in my real life I, I, I work for a supercomputing center at uh, McGill <laughs> University in Canada. So just we, because we're in a retro computing Workshop, this is where it all started. This was the, the kind of computer that my, my parents had when I was a teenager. Uh, it was a Commodore PC-23. Um, actually, this is one I found on Wikipedia. It's not the real one. We had one with a 720K floppy drive instead of the, the five and a quarter one that, that is displayed over here. So we had somewhat more, more modern floppies. Uh, and in the beginning, sometimes we had floppies that didn't fit and we had to <coughs> copy them over to the small ones. That's quite a few years ago. Um, so this is, probably most of you will know, this is how DOS at the time before FreeDOS existed. You only had MS-DOS and when you, when you installed MS-DOS you were given this F-Disk uh, welcome screen, which was a purely text-based of course. The, the computer I just saw, had, I just showed that our house was connected to a monochrome monitor which only had uh, Hercules graphics mode of 720 by 348 pixels uh, and with a bit of tricks you could make it either amber or or dark amber if you make uh, one out of every <coughs> pixel black. So Dotsamu is one of the oldest projects around that was purely aimed at Linux. So the when I go back into history and I, I at one point I downloaded all the old tarballs uh, the very first version was a 0.1 version released on September 3, 1992, which makes DOSMU almost 26 years old. Um, maybe older than some of the people in this room, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he released it as DOS emulator for Linux 0.97PL2. <coughs> and 0.97PL2 was, of course, the version of the Linux kernel at the, that time. Because uh, there was for, it was a very very fast-paced development, so things were very tightly coupled. Uh, there was a feature added to Linux kernel, and then we started using it straight away, and it was very hectic development at those times. <laughs> um, so, of course, it was a pre-alpha release with some bugs, and, but people started using it, and uh, in the years from 1993 to 1997, there was uh, quite rapid development. A lot of people <laughs> contributed to it. It was kind of one of the standard parts of a Linux distribution just because many people were still using DOS, uh, usually on a separate partition. There was usually a FAT partition and, a, and an X2 partition at the time, uh, one to run DOS, the other one to run Linux. Now, things stabilized a little bit when, uh, so we had Robert Sanders and James McLean, who added DOS protected mode support, DPMI. It's very useful because uh, many of the DOS programs developed in the 90s used protected mode using this DOS protected mode interface. Um, Hans Lehrman took over. He sadly passed away a few years ago. But he, um, he's, he stabilized DOS uh, really into a 1.0 version, which uh, made it possible to run it without needing root anymore. And, and a lot of things stabilized during those years. Uh, still, there was still a lot of work to be done, and we I took over in 2001, uh, worked on it for a little while, uh, 
the page, <laughs> the page went down a little bit, and at some point, a long-time contributor, Stas Stergev, started his own um, project. It's called a little bit for legal issues that he basically was responsible for it, and it's kind of called DOSEMI2. So this is basically what you get when, when you start DOSEMI. Uh, this is DOSEMI2 in a box. So this is when you run it without any command line options. You get a, a, uh, a box on your screen which has the DOS emulator and then you can start whatever DOS program you like as long as you've installed it. Um, one way I actually like to, to run DOS emu is if I need to do something for, for free DOS like a compilation or things like that, I, I run it in, in dumb mode, <coughs> which means it runs in the terminal and it just displays whatever text is given to to the terminal, so it, it actually it doesn't uh, you you cannot do any graphics or even even text mode utilities that use the full screen that will not work in this mode because it it just doesn't understand it. Uh, but it's very helpful because if you compile programs, you just run as if in a Linux terminal. You can use the scroll back buffer and all these features. Um, so this is just running it in an X term and it took the screenshot of the X term. Then there's some intermediate mode. So the default is, I, I believe it's SDL or X, depending on which libraries you've installed. There's also an SLang terminal mode, which means you can run it in a terminal, but all the text mode utilities work okay. As long as you make that terminals 80 by 25, it, it will work okay. If you use different sizes, it may not work. You can run, of course, many games in, in <coughs> DOSEMU. Um, this is one I, I, I liked at the time, SimCity 2000, but with a f just about 99% of all DOS games will, will work in DOSEMU. There's a couple of exceptions that do weird things with, with VGA uh, graphics uh, or sometimes weird tricks with protected mode and they don't work. But mostly, uh, mostly it works. And there's also other solutions to run DOS games these days. We have DOSBox, and, uh, which is squarely aimed at games and can, can handle some of these very weird cases. Um, one of the most heavyweight protected mode applications that we can run in DOSEMU is Windows 3.1, um, including networking. So this is a, a contributed screenshot. It contributed a long time ago to the DOSEMU website, running f Windows 3.1 <coughs> with Netscape with the network. So he's running a very old version of Netscape to browse the web. It, it's probably completely insecure, and, but uh, it, it only understands basic HTML anyway, so I don't think it supports JavaScript yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I was curious, so what use people use DOSEMU for? Of course they, they run it to to run their favorite old DOS games or for favorite old DOS applications. So I asked around on the mailing list, I said, so what do you guys use it for? So I said, well some, some people use it to run very old specialized cross compilers. So they had DOS compilers and they've just never been updated. And so <coughs> you can run it all set up with wrappers, so from the user point of view, there are just Linux programs. That, that probably goes via that dump mode. They just type the, the Linux command, and behind the scenes, it's starting up DOSEMU, and, and it does an <coughs> internal exit emu, which uh, quits the emulator, and then um, the user doesn't even know they're running DOSEMU. Um, one user was <coughs> claiming that they did a yearly ephemeris for astrologers with a quick basic IDE. He's slowly porting it to Linux by um, the database, but just to be able to do the porting, he has to start somewhere and, and be able what he's working with, and he uses DOSEMU for that. Some people run old DOS CAD CAD programs for the design of electronics and astronomical instruments. There was one user who, who has a, a very old science-free personal organizer, and he, he still claims that it's the ideal way of doing his calendar, etc. He wants nothing of modern phones, etc. But still, his old organizer. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> yes, and he had Link software from from Psion from 1991, which he then has to connect to his computer. So he's using a USB serial <laughs> hardware module on his computer, and then the serial cable can be connected to, from the adapter <coughs> to the Psion phone. Uh, uh, sorry, personal organizer. And uh, and then with DOSEMU he can run that program and, and link to his 
linked to his organizer. Some people are interested in running MIDI se sequencers. The, the MIDI emulation is quite mature, it's been for a while. Uh, some people use it in POS terminals, so they're uh, POS terminals have been running and uh, still some are running plain DOS for, for quite a while. And uh, they, um, I believe Stas Sergeyev had, had, a, had a little bit of a commercial, um, like a paid for project where, where he, he made that work. Um, there is also, there's a retro, there's, an, there's a community of people who are still interested in PC TOS. It's one of the old uh, GUIs that were available for DOS and According to them, DOSM is one of the best ways of running it. And then there is a group in Scotland, I believe. Uh, they're using it at the university to receive satellite images. They have an old program that, that uses ISA hardware. Um, there is a hook in the Linux kernel that lets DOSM directly talk to ISA hardware and catch the interrupts. And he said that ISA motherboards are still for sale, so he didn't even have to port it to a PSI motherboard yet. So where does it fit? Um, does that mean we have somewhat heterogeneous competition? It's competition in open source sense, so we're not really uh, uh, fighting for, for money. But um, of course there's DOSBox. Um, but whenever you ask to, on DOSBox uh, user forums about anything that's not a game, they say, sorry, we only do games. So um, they do, they, they've done an, awful, an awesome job uh, with running games. Uh, they do, they've been doing very well in trying to emulate exactly the, the hardware for, for several um, computers from the time. There's now even a DOSBox X fork that basically uh, tries to even more accurately emulate uh, hardware from the time. He even went as far as to emulate snow from old CGA monitors. Um, so this is cool if you really want the old experience, including the, uh, the speed, etc., from the old days, uh, because it uses completely CPU emulations, which means you have absolute control about what happens. Dosemu has always been more about performance, so we're 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 still a ways to run on the on the on the real CPU, and this way I go go faster than DOSBox typically. But um, it just depends on the task at hand. And of course, we have the, the heavyweight emulators in virtual machine, like Box. Box is pure emulator, as you might know. Uh, QEMU and virtual box are 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 more virtual machines. They're used all over the place in in in, in, in most businesses these days, but they feel heavy to me compared to DOS MU. When you run DOS MU, you start it up, it starts up in split second, and you have direct access to the Linux file system. With these virtual machines, you feel like you're more in a separate box that is sort of attached to your computer, and you need to set up a network, and then a network file system, and, and it, it, it just doesn't feel, it feels a bit too remote from the host compared to uh, DOS MU. Just, uh, the typical experience of just needing to run an old DOS application. So one of the development challenges we've had over the years with DOSMU was uh, Linux kernel and the hardware. So every now and then the Linux kernel developers gave us a challenge and we had to adapt, otherwise we wouldn't run anymore. So. And that sort of stems that Dosemi was talking very intimately to the Linux kernel. Um, <coughs> in the beginning, Dosemi was just ran as root. I mean, people just ran it on their own PC. They ran things as root, and then, uh, well, who, who cares about said UID? These were the old wild days, and people were typically not connected to the internet anyway. So, um, so it was ran as as root or, or said UID root with direct VTA hardware access. So you basically run DOSMU and you open up all the ports to the VTA hardware and you could just display whatever the DOS application sent to the screen. It was displayed directly on the monitor. Um, that, you, that usually worked very well in the, in the early years. Sometimes people would burn their monitor, but uh, typically it wouldn't happen. Uh, usually what would happen is the system just locked up and you get a black screen, you have to reboot your computer. 
Um, and the other thing they could do was direct fat partition disk access because people typically had a fat partition. So you could just say to DOS Info, just access that partition as if it's a DOS partition and, and will this work? Just, just make sure that there are no Linux programs running, writing to that partition at the same time where you can get really odd things happening. Um, so we had some, some changes. First thing is that there was an M memory mapping of proc self X, which means that you have the, the image of the executable can be mapped into memory, and that way you can inspect it and even map it a different place in memory, which we have to use for um, a system called EMS expanded memory mapping, which has a piece of memory that is banked into a particular place in DOS memory. Um, so we had to use the different methods. We can also do it via file or, or SHM open. So that they gave us alternatives which were useful. What was harder is the disabled MMAP of page zero. So this is something for, yeah, for the VM86 system call. It maps the low memory page zero for DOS to page zero in uh, Linux user space. At some point, they found out that people were exploiting that zero page to do very security exploits, and for security reason, it was it disabled the MMAP for page zero by default. You can still set it via sysctl. However, we need to do ways around so that people who didn't have root privilege, for instance, didn't have to, or were <laughs> concerned about security, didn't have to set that sysctl. And we had to use CPU emulation, uh, or later on KVM, which I'll get in a couple slides, instead of VM86. The DPMI stuff can still be used because modify LDT <laughs> is another system call. We can offset the system-based addresses. Also, with kernel mode setting, direct VGA was gone for most people. Most computers, it didn't work anymore, but we had VGA emulation, and it usually works OK. Of course, x86-64, it doesn't do VM86. It doesn't have V86 mode anymore. And in the beginning, we just had to use CPU emulation. Later on, KVM came to the rescue. <coughs> <laughs> so DOS ME2, which is Stas Serge's product, he's been uh, doing a lot of heavy development. At some point it was a little bit unstable, then it stabilized again. They've been doing a lot of bug fixes. Um, a lot of internal changes made things a little bit more reliable, in some cases a lot more reliable. And another cool thing is that there was uh, a little product called the HX DOS Extender, which can run win Windows 32 binaries in DOS, and it works in, in bare DOS, but it also works in DOS M. And the support for that has been improved a lot, and so you can run most common line Win32 binaries in, in DOS M. You know. It's kind of a little alternative to Wine in some cases. <coughs> so for KVM, basically, I was my contribution to DOS M2. I read an article on LWN. Uh, very useful that explain how to use KVM and even gave a little example how to how to get into a very basic <coughs> DOS style setup. And I implement that into into DOSMU and I found out that that, that that still gives a significant performance boost. I went from doing like a, a compilation of a DOS utility named common.com uh, we went from 57 seconds with our fastest emulator, the, the JIT emulator, just in time, or even four minutes with the simulated CPU emulation that we use as a back, backup in case the JIT fails. Uh, it went to nine and a half seconds, so it's still using it on bare hardware was quite a, a, a boost. And so at this point, there was no advantage to, to uh, booting your computer in using an i386 kernel just because it provided VM86, because the KVM is just as fast. We can also do the protected mode in KVM, but it hasn't been finished yet. So that was basically the overview for, for DOSEMU. Now to move to FreeDOS. Um, so FreeDOS started a little bit later than DOSEMU in 1994. It's also 24 years ago. Um, so this was Jim Hall who came up with the idea of starting a FreeDOS when MS-DOS was sort of winding down and being replaced by Windows 95. It still had a sort of DOS under the hood, a DOS 7.1, DOS 7.0, but at that point he, he thought, well, if we can make 
a free Unix-like operating system. We can also make a free DOS-style operating system. So he was starting the project and got some people around him. And at the same time, he got somebody, Pat Filani, who had written a, a DOS kernel in C. He contributed the DOS C kernel to the free DOS project, and that sort of got it started in getting a kernel and then developed that further. So there was a first uh, release in 1998 called FreeDOS Beta 1, and then that moved into a few other betas, and eventually FreeDOS 1.0 was 2006. By that time, FreeDOS was quite stable, uh, and it was actually seen all over the place. Uh, Dell and other manufacturers put it as a backup operating system in case they wanted to ship a computer without an operating system, which they couldn't do, so they just put free DOS on there. And it's probably also in various computers uh, in, in your backup uh, BIOS update partition or things like that. I've seen, I've seen it all over the place. So this is the free DOS 1.0 announced on the website. That's when, about 10 years ago, and a few years after, uh, only in 2016, there was updated to FreeDOS 1.2, uh, mostly an update of the utilities. It's became a bit more complete. And at the moment, there's some discussion on the mailing list about what, what you do for the next FreeDOS uh, version 2.0. Um, so there's this. There's a strong consensus on the mailing list that, that compatibility is key. I mean, if you change the operating system to a 32-bit operating system, you may end up with something that's not compatible anymore because it's really thoroughly a 16-bit OS with DOS programs that do all kind of weird things in memory and uh, uh, it may not work anymore. Uh, you may get some compatibility, but it may not be completely compatible anymore. So. What is a modern DOS tools and utility? So there are lots of things in FreeDOS that the original DOS didn't have, but they're mostly part of the tools. Uh, the command.com is a lot friendlier than, than what Microsoft originally shipped. Uh, shipped. There's FAT32 support. There's all kinds of things in the, in the tools and utilities that were not there at the time. Um, and there's a couple of things that may not be needed anymore, some, some old tools that hardly anybody uses. Uh, but um, I personally... Not sure if these should go. Uh, they, they have their use and they're only very small. So if you remove them, you're saving maybe 150 kilobytes. So it's not not a big deal. One of the things that's been plaguing the distribution of DOS AMU for a while is the is the distribution issue. So at some point around 2000, distribution started to get more. Uh, conscious about various licensing issues and particularly it was discussed in Debian the problem was that DOS MU cannot run without a DOS you need to provide a DOS it isn't included like in DOSBox includes its own little DOS uh, enough to play games but in DOS MU you need a DOS otherwise it just doesn't boot um, <coughs> however that, do that DOS was still compiled in the 90s it was compiled with a Borland C compiler and that's proprietary so you have a build dependency to get free DOS, which in turn is needed for DOS MU. So, so for instance, uh, distributions like Debian said, oh, we need to move the whole thing into, into the cron trip repository instead of main. So it wasn't shipped anymore unless you downloaded it somewhere. Um, so eventually, we got an open source compiler finally, which was Open Watcom. Um, open Watcom was released uh, by Sybase, who wasn't interested in, in it anymore. They, they basically bought Waterloo software. But um, they released it, but they, they based their license on an Apple public uh, software license. And it has a lot of clauses in it, which were somewhat, somewhat uh, dubious. Uh, and even some people think, what was the OSI smoking when they approved that license? So it's released on a license that is open source, but not free software. Uh, this is what life is, but in practice, open Watcom is considered as open sources on GitHub, etc. Uh, there's a um, version 2 in the works. Um, however, it would still be nice to compile these FreeDOS utilities for GCC to make it properly free software. And there's been some attempts to have uh, a 16 bit code chain added to GCC. This only, this only happened, happened quite recently. 
uh, compared to development of TCC that in the 90s and 80s when 16-bit was very common, TCC was 32-bit only. So there were some 16-bit some contributions. Andrew Jenner, or first was Rask Ingeman Lambertson, 2007, the patch was sort of forgotten. Andrew Jenner uh, refined it and made it based on TCC 6.2, and now there's uh, another guy, TK Chia, who, who uh, contributed small model and far pointers to this IA16 ELF TC. It actually creates ELF objects. I've been, I've been emailing and bugging his GitHub uh, repository with uh, quite a few bugs when I tried to compile the Fritos kernel with it, and eventually I succeeded and I had the, the Fritos kernel uh, compiled with TCC, and the same with uh, with the Fritos command com. Needs a few tricks with linker scripts, etc. It's a bit too technical for this for this talk, but it works. Um, Stas has also been bothered by this uh, this hiatus, and he started to do a different thing. This this. Uh, slide has a lot of text on it, but what he's been doing is basically try to rewrite the Fritos kernel in 32-bit, just to have the assembly code in 16-bit, most of the C code in 32-bit, and then have little stops to switch back and forth to protected mode. He was quite proud that he got it somewhat working and have the copyright notice uh, debugging the, the protected mode in CDB and the real mode in the DOS, uh, DOS ME debugger utility and he wanted me to share it with you so because he's quite proud of it. It's actually quite a work uh, doing this all in very modern C++ template programming. So he's, uh, so maybe at some point we will we'll finally have some kind of reliable 32-bit DOS kernel after all. So this is uh, just a bunch of links where you can find these, these DOS ME and FreeDOS utilities. But I think I've covered everything now just in time. And thank you for your attention. So we have a few minutes for questions. So uh, don't be shy. Just make sure you repeat for the rest yes. of the uh, Why not use DJGPP to compile uh, DOS code? We do for 32 bits. That's a very mature solution, it was mature in the 90s, but it doesn't do 16-bit. Yeah. So, a lot of talk about um, <laughs> DOS kernels are kind of implicit in that they work for IBM compatibles. Um, how, how, like, for example, the FreeDOS, um, what's, what's the attitude of FreeDOS towards emulating slash importing non-IBM compatibles? The question is, how does Fritos work with IBM non-compatibles? Um, I, I don't think there is much, but there, it, it relies on certain BIOS functions being, yeah. being available. So at, at, at the moment, there's some efforts to get Fritos working on, on some uh, things like core boot and things like that, and they, they actually implement these BIOS functions, typically. So it hasn't been a big problem in practice, but maybe there's some very old computers that don't, are not completely IBM compatible. There hasn't been any special effort for that that I know of, just because nobody had them. <laughs> yeah? If it's possible to... Yes. So he's asking if it's possible to to load uh, Fritos via Grub. Um, on the modern computer, it's possible. Uh, you may have to switch off secure boot and all kind of UEFI stuff, make it as basic legacy as possible. And then you can load Fritos via Grub via a chain loader, just a little 512 byte uh, boot sector style piece of code that, it, that Grub can load and in turn that loads the Fritos kernel. It's possible. Is there some uh, code shared between DOSEMU and DOSBOX or um, A tiny bit. It, it means that, for instance, when DOSBOX implemented their FreeGA emulator, they, they looked at our code 
because I, I could see a common in the FreeGA MLS, a uh, oh, nice one from, from DOSMU. And I did the same thing that I ported a few things from DOSBox into DOSMU. But beyond a little bit of porting, there's, n there's not any code sharing. And they're very different code bases. Uh, DOSBox from the, from the get-go was developed as a, as a portable C program that runs with STL, whereas DOSMU is a much longer history of, of being more Linux specific. Another question? How do you handle uh, special formatting for protection and so on? You know, all the old games were protected with a very special diskette formatting. Copy, copyright protection. How do we deal with special formatting for old games? Um, in some cases we can't. Uh, I mean, uh, often, often they're for these kind of things, apparently there are cracks available. It's not very legal, but uh, I, I think that's what people do, yeah, when they want to run these things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but yeah. But uh, just, just to add to your question, I mean, it is possible to emulate a diskette and just have a have a have an image as a floppy drive. That's what I'm saying about Yeah. And that's. That's I mean, okay. Sides, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so very, very few computers have floppy drives anymore. But you can have a a colon as a 720 kilobyte image or whatever image you you throw it at. Yeah. Could be easier with your stuff that is uh, VMware. Um, does one all one zero running under VMware, but it's yeah. more difficult. Okay. Yeah, no, with, with, with DOSM, it's just one of the configuration options that you can set a, uh, the A drive to, to, uh, to an image file. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks.